last Sunday we started a study of Jesus' dictation given in September 1995 which is found in volume 38 number 38 of the Pearls of Wisdom. For those of you who would like to research it what we have to say today even more. Last Sunday he talked about developing our Christhood and he taught us how we develop that Christhood. I want to follow what we did last Sunday by his instruction on where we might mess up our incarnation and what we can do about it. As I was preparing earlier this morning, I was, I asked the master, can you give me some way of really illustrating what you're trying to tell us? For we have heard this before, we have been disciplined before. We, this whole thing of becoming that Christ, we've heard it for 20 some years, some of us. How can we bring it alive? And as the service started today, he gave me a picture, which I would like to start by sharing what I see or what I saw. Now we all know that it wasn't by chance that we came here. We all know that uh, there had to be some decisions someplace and it wasn't just on the physical side of life. Before we came here, it's my understanding, that, that we had to sit down and work out a plan. And that plan had to include everything that we saw before we came here, what we needed to accomplish in order to ascend. In other words, to set the stage for a victory thrust in this lifetime. So after we worked out all the details, our parents, the situation we would come into to work out certain problems, all of the things in life, we have it all down and we had to submit it. And the karmic board sat down and looked at it. And sometimes we had so much that they sent us back and said, no, no, you'd forget what it's like to get into the physical. You cannot accomplish all of that. Redo it. And so we've tried and tried and until we finally got the okay. And then things st started to move quickly. And as we made our approach, the angel from the karmic board, the, 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 uh, the personage from the karmic board said to us, we will be with you. We will remind you along the way. We will not leave you without help. Or something like that. And then we closed the door and we came in. Now we're here to represent something higher than our physical self. We're actually a manifestation of the Father, Mother, God. We are God in manifestation. But what does that mean? And so as we get started in life and we move according to the thrust of our parents and the environment we're in, etc., we sometimes get way off the bait 
and miss our whole reason for being. And so as I sat here and pondering this, as the psalmist read and as we sang the songs and as the scripture, suddenly I saw a picture. Now all of us are aware of a football team. And here you have the coach who could represent Helios or the Ascended Masters. And you have the team and each of us are a part of that team. And as the game goes on and it gets tough, you see the coach seeing somebody isn't following through what he knows he should be doing. He's got other things on his mind, perhaps uh, uh, his girlfriend or his uh, his son or daughter's in problems or he's getting a divorce or something or other and he's just not there. And so he reaches back and he asks one of the substitutes to come up, shows him what he's doing, not doing, and sends him forth and so the substitute is ready to take off and he goes in with a tremendous thrust. But what they find when they get in there, the opposition is tougher than they think. They're not quite ready and so on. And so the game goes on. I saw all this this morning. And then I began to see, this is the, Jesus' answer for us to really begin to see what our predicament is. He starts out in the second half of this study. We of the Darjeeling Council recognize that there is a mounting darkness in the earth and we are very concerned. In football language, the coach says, this thing is not going according to Hoyle. There is more opposition than what we expected now something's got to happen if we're going to win this game. We've got to start pulling it together. And this is what he's saying. The darkness that covers the land is the darkness of mankind's karma. It steals its way into the sub-levels of the mind, not only at winter solstice, but every day of the year. Then it cast its shadow on the soul as it tempts her to go the way of all flesh. The mind too is entranced with darkness as it receives from television programs and motion pictures millions of impressions of negativity which are then processed and assimilated in the subconscious mind. On the subject of darkness, I also wish to tell you that the fallen angels do not allow themselves to be seen when they are out and about doing their nefarious deeds. They lurk in the shadows and recruit the youth to do their business. And so the youth are lured into making karma with the fallen angels. Instead of going about their father's business, beloved, they go about tending the businesses of the mafia and other illegal operations. They join street gangs and through them they become fully entranced with the sinister force. And because they have the support of that force they are able to conceal their unlawful activities for many decades. What are the fallen angels actually doing? They are boring into the souls of the general population as well as into the souls of the youth. They are correcting, they are corrupting the communications media 
of the world and every department of life on earth. Have you noticed? So many things are now happening which doesn't really go along with that which is the deepest within ourselves. What they're teaching in schools nowadays. What the, the youth in colleges are suddenly coming up with. You say, wait a minute, something's wrong here. It isn't what it used to be. It isn't the way I was raised. Why is this happening? Their plan, the plan of the fall of, of the uh, negative force, is to work stealth until the day when they raise the world curtain and the world in horror sees what has been building and what is now about to descend on the planet. And certainly in the last few years, we have been seeing more and more as that curtain is pulled back and you see the crookedness of what's happening, the crookedness in politics, the crookedness in religion, the crookedness in, in business, etc. And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not the way it should be. And it's because there is a glaze over the eyes of the people. Jesus is talking now. Because there is a glaze over the eyes of the people, I, Jesus, have allowed certain planetary judgments to descend. You have stood back and observed the judgments that have descended upon the world. Because there was a glaze. Are you getting anything? Well, there's a delay. I mean, there's there's a delay. Oh wait. Okay. It still shows here we're on the air. I, I saw when we lost it a second. Okay, then we're gonna have to probably come back. Instead of going about their father's business, beloved, go, they go about telling, tending the businesses of the mafia and other illegal operations. He's talking about the youth. They join street gangs, and through them they become fully entrenched with the sinister force. And because they have the support of that force, they are able to conceal their unlawful activities for many decades. What are the fallen angels actually doing? They are boring into the souls of the general population as well as into the souls of the youth. They are corrupting the communications media of the world and every department of life on earth. Their plan is to work in stealth until the day when they raise the world curtain and the world in horror sees what has been building and what is now about to descend upon the planet. And one can see this if you're looking at the news and you're hearing language that should never have ever been in the public eye or ear. We're calling people names which are impossible to be true. Anything to destroy. It's, it's just unbelievable where we are headed. It's, you can feel the whole thing going down, down, down. He says, because there is a glaze over the eyes of the people, 
I, Jesus, have allowed certain planetary judgments to descend. You have stood back and observed the judgments that, that have descended upon the world. Some have come down on, upon the Western Hemisphere, others upon the Eastern Hemisphere. And among those who observe, some are at the, the side of calamity, at this side of calamity, and some on the other side. Beloved, I tell you, it is better that the world see than that the world not see what is coming upon the earth. Thus understand that where there is murder, where there is crime, where there is suicide, the evil forces come to reinforce the darkness. I tell you, beloved, you should not let a day pass that you do not cast out the dweller on the threshold of your subconscious mind by giving decree 2009 and the powerful fiats to your mighty I am presence and your holy Christ self to bind that dweller and to break the stranglehold it has on you. What is the dweller? The dweller is your alternate self that you have created out of the momentums of negativity that you have developed. Those momentums become such like it's, you, you, if you want to be a smoker or you take a few cigarette puffs and then you take more and then pretty soon it begins to drive you. This is what drugs do. Suddenly that becomes your consciousness. I got to have a cigarette or I have to have this or I have to have that. You become possessed. It's a momentum. And this is what he's saying. He said, once you have cleared yourself and loved ones around you, call for the binding of the dweller on the threshold of all the evildoers on the earth and then support with fervent calls those who would exercise their dwellers but do not know how to disentangle themselves from their human creation, all this momentum that they have created or how to process the contents of the unconscious mind where the dweller lies in wait to destroy the soul. Call for the violet flame in their behalf and if they are open-minded, teach them the difference between the real self and the unreal self or the dweller. The people of earth have a responsibility to maintain equilibrium of their planet. And the light bearers have a responsibility to the world at large to keep the flame of life burning at the altar of their hearts. For it is the threefold flame tended on the altars of millions of devout hearts that will in the end prevent major cataclysm. This is a constant struggle. We are in the battle of Armageddon, the battle of light versus darkness. And it's the thoughts of the people, the momentum of those thoughts that create an environment that hold everything together. If suddenly we all become fearful, that which we fear comes upon us. But if all of us have that inner peace, that peace, you know, in the Old Testament we find he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. If our thoughts and our vibrations are high, nothing can affect everything. But if we begin to get down and start using lesser and lesser thought patterns for our life, then the whole aura 
basic consciousness, the baseline of the civilization starts going down. And this is what he's talking about here. If you want to keep major cataclysm from happening, we have to keep the vibration up of the total. Now you're not going to do that when people have free will, but if the majority or if a large section of the people have that threefold flame really tuned in, it will carry all the rest. They say one person can affect millions of people. You and I can do this. And that's why it's so important to understand first our role in this game of life, what we promised before we came in, and how the masters have been training us to do what we have to do in this most difficult time, the final battle of this cycle that we talked about last week, which is the battle of the Armageddon. At the end of this cycle, we have to cleanse the earth or go down with it. And so we've chosen to cleanse the earth. And this is why he's showing us now, this is how you do this. And it's our Christhood, it's our way of living and being that will lift the frequency of the all. He said this is a year when the beloved Portia, goddess of justice, is very close to the messenger and therefore very close to all of you. And, and this was what, 19, 1995, so it's been a few years ago. But that doesn't mean it's not applicable to today. He said, pray that the angel of God open the prison doors and let out those who are there through no fault of their own. But because the system favors the powerful and ignores the lowly, this must be your call. In other words, there are many people being beset by the government and so on because they are not strong enough or rich enough for, for some reason. I even saw the other day in the news that there is a, there are several non-profit Christian organizations working for liberty, freedom, and now they are being cause being called terrorists because they aren't using the language and moving into bondage like the fallen ones want. It's an amazing thing that's happening and that's why you and I need to become aware and really lift this thing and work with it day after day because things are not going the easy way. He said, Acts records when Herod imprisoned Peter. The church prayed to God for him without ceasing. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. A chain here to this soldier, chain here with this soldier. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and bind on your, your sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel but he thought it was just a vision when they went past the first and the second ward they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city which openeth to them of its own accord and they went out and passed through on to one street and forthwith the angel departed from him and when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod. And so Peter escaped by the hand of the angel. 
as the early church prayed for Peter, so you must not fail to pray to the mighty angels of God to bring divine justice to those who are deserving of that justice. Is it not a marvel that you need not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul? I instructed my disciples on this 2,000 years ago. Fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who would that be? It would be a fallen one. It would be so nice to you. And he looks so good. And he's so excited about what he believes. And he's very open for you to follow him. And being of the light, we trust everybody. And so we follow him. And we suddenly realize we are not where we were a year ago. He says, this day, I empower you to raise up the rod of divine justice among you and to call in my name and in the name of my Father for the judgment of those who have the power to destroy the soul and body in hell. These go after. They are the ones that are leading our youth astray. They are the ones that give us those wrong impressions. They are the ones who suck the life out of us as we begin to let our thoughts and energies go to them. He said, go after the fallen angels, whether they occupy earthly bodies or astral bodies. For those who have developed the powers of the devil to destroy both body and soul in hell through their allegiance to, to Satan, to Lucifer, or to one of the hierarchs of death, they must be bound, beloved. Cry out to the living God that he might send legions of angels to accomplish the defeat of the rebels against God and his sons and daughters. For we cry out to you, go back to your spiritual laborers in King Arthur's court and focus your dynamic decrees and your meditations on what is destroying Western civilization. Now I was on staff for a good many years and I experienced this kind of push. We would be given spiritual labors and we would decree hour upon hour upon hour and if it was really really serious all the work that we were assigned to do were cancelled and we sat and worked for the spirit. It was labor and it was sweat because we had a job to do. He says from our perspective, those of the ascended masters, one of the factors that is destroying western civilization is the denial on the part of some that there is anything wrong with the current downward trends or that there are any wrongdoers systematically focusing on the dismantling of society and its ultimate destruction. All you have to do is watch the news today and you see this very thing you see those who would like to hold the energies and move upward. And you would you very easily see those who have no limits and downward they go. Did you notice 
in the news. A minister walked in to the president's office, or several ministers, I don't know how many of them, and after talking with him for a while, they offered to pray for him. And his answer was, please. And so they got around him, and they put their hands on his shoulders, and they prayed for the illumination of God. But when those looking from the outside in saw the picture and heard it, what happened, they said, oh, terrible, strange things are happening in the president's office now, strange things. You say, wait a minute, that's not strange at all. This country was built on prayer. It was built on this kind of concept, but we no longer accept it, do we? Or do we? This we need to look at. Look at the interviews they're having with college students. There's nothing there anymore. You can say, uh, who was Washington? They don't know. Who, I saw the other day they were asking some of them, what is Castile Day for the French? I don't know. I don't know. You say, wait a minute, where's history? Where is the awareness? Who is going to lead the country? Somehow, there's something missing. He says, if you have not come to grips with the reality that evil can work through anyone, well-intentioned or not, including yourself, in an unguarded moment, then you have missed the vital point of the path all of these years. Think about why you tarry in your sanctuaries to give your dynamic decrees and intense prayers to God, especially those you devote to the Archangel Michael and the host of the God Star Sirius. Why do you do this, beloved? You do this because a large percentage of the people evolving on the planet cannot and will not believe that evil is a force to be reckoned with. They do not want to know that evil in the form of the dweller on the threshold lurks in their own unconscious mind until they wage war against the not-self and only when they completely vanquish the not-self or the dweller are they able to discern light and darkness, good and evil. Since early childhood, many of you have had to deal directly with evil incarnate that has come through family members, relatives, and neighbors day in and day out. You have come to know the vile nature of those who embody the ultimate anger against Almighty God and His servants on the earth. Some of you have been victimized by dangerous individuals who have been abused, beaten, and murdered people you have known, you yourselves scarcely escaping with the same fate. Finally, you have had enough and you have said, by God, there is evil in this world and I intend to do something about it. And the first thing I intend to do is to not deny that evil has a force of its own, an army of its own, and a plan for the destruction of the world. We have to see this. We have to begin to operate from that point of reference. Keep the flame, beloved. Keep the flame. 
And if you have not understood the psychology of evil and the mechanizations of evil, I suggest that you read a number of good books that will show you how evil infests the mind. People who have an evil intent are usually bent upon self-destruction, but their persona is beguiling. What does beguiling mean? It's deceptive. Ah, oh, they're so nice, they're so smooth. They are so beautiful, they, they can speak very, very well. And you say, well, that person must have a, a lot of light to do that. Oh yes, take a look a little deeper. It is calculated to deceive the very elect. If you have not knowingly encountered such people, beware, for I have sent you into the world to analyze and then to challenge those individuals whom one of your modern authors calls the people of the lie. The people of the lie. You don't have to look very far nowadays to see the people of the lie that the masters are really exposing to the world. If you are detached and take a look, you can't believe the lies and the unspoken de determination for destruction that is there. The person who wrote that book, The People of the Lie, happens to be a doctor called Scott Peck. He was an MD. It's a book you need to read. He's a psychiatrist. You must understand evil so that you might get the victory over evil and so that through you the world itself might get the victory over evil. You change your vibration and it immediately begins to affect everybody else's vibration. And the higher you can go, the more around you is changed. We can change the world. Every thought we think has an effect not only on ourselves, not only on our families, but on the world, the vibration. Therefore, lament not that you have been burdened by the circumstances of your life, or been persecuted, or been in dysfunctional homes. You had lessons to learn and karmas to pay and many of you are still paying them. Praise God for the opportunity to be in embodiment and make the most of life's journey. We have to begin to see there's no, God, God, there is no chances with God. You are in the situation that you are in because of reasons basically our own reasons, our own karma, our own needing to work through certain problems, etc., etc. The major lesson that you came into embodiment to learn is what is evil and what, what is its modus operandi. Indeed, you came to learn how it is possible that souls of light can be duped again and again by the forces of evil. You know, we're raised as people who talk truth. And so we trust one another. We are open to one another. And no one has taught us how to discern the difference between a light bearer and one who's not a light bearer because he can act like a light bearer. And so we just open ourselves up and we get taken time and time again, lifetime after lifetime, succumb, succumbing to the serpent and his lie, thou shalt not surely die, as Eve did when she was bitten by him to partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And indeed, 
the pitfall of the race of Adam. Her unfortunate example and her husband's after her is a major lesson for all sons and daughters of God. The cunning serpent is still able to lure the children of God away from divine reality and their origins in the great central sun. Such is the extreme animal magnetism of the fallen angels that they are able to lure the soul by half-truths, convincing her that the consequences of disobedience to God lead not to death, but to a sort of mortal godhood. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Look all around you, beloved, and you will observe that many who are once who were once light bearers now believe they are gods. They hobnob with the gods of industry, of money, of the media, etc., etc. Without further discussion, I lay this subject on your heart. Ponder it well for your failure to recognize evil incarnate in the fallen angels in your midst is your greatest stumbling block on the spiritual path. It is the major test that light bearers fail again and again. And until they pass that test, not only will they be vulnerable to the forces of evil, but the evolutions of earth who follow their lead will also be vulnerable to the forces of evil. So if we fail, those who follow us will fail as well. Like father, like son. Like mother, like daughter. We just copy and keep going. When you understand this equation, he says, you will gain your personal victory over death and hell. When you no longer allow the fallen angels to manipulate you, for you see through them and their ploys from A to Z, you will then be of the utmost assistance to the Darjeeling Council. And one day, you may even receive the mantle of conquering hero or heron, heroine for meritorious service in exposing the seed of the wicked one. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Do not whitewash the deeds of the seed of the wicked. Do not sympathize with the sorrows of Satan or his cohorts, but meditate upon the wondrous love of God and contemplate his wisdom. Go to the altar and let God tell you through your mighty I am presence what is truth, what is error, what is real, what is unreal. It's funny how we go to everybody else around us asking, what do you think about the president? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? So on. Rather than sitting down, going into meditation and asking the master himself, what about this man? What about this woman? What about this? What about that? This is the reason why we can be so easily misled. He says, when I sent the other 70 disciples two by two before me to prepare the way for my coming into every city where I would go, and that was the scripture that was read this morning, they returned with joy, for the devils were subject unto them in my name. For my presence was both with them and in them. Then I told them that I had beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. At that point I empowered them in my name to tread on serpents and scorpions 
and to neutralize the power of the enemy. And I promised them that nothing would by any means hurt them. Finally, I told them to rejoice not that the spirits were subject unto them, but that their names were written in heaven. You know, we start working with miracles. And we say, wow, that's so great. Let's see if we can have another miracle and another miracle and another miracle. And suddenly, wait a minute, the miracles happen because I was this way. But suddenly I am so engrossed in this becoming powerful enough to see these miracles happen that suddenly it doesn't happen anymore. We have to see that it's only when I am in tune and it happens through me. It's not what happens at my hands, it's that I am in tune with the Father. He said, why do you think I sent my disciples before me? It was not only that they might prepare the way before me and deliver my word, but so that they might have the experience of knowing good and evil, and that, they, and that they might recall that experience in later centuries, for they must never forget what is the mask of evil, and how to tear the mask from the evil one, and expose the liar and his lie. Yes, how to identify the ones who are subtly moving against the light. And they could be part of us. They could be part of our families. They could be, and we totally ignore it or can't see it. Blessed ones, there are many Nephilim in power today. Among, among the most deadly are the Nephilim who control the motion picture industry. It is well known that they can captivate and manipulate the minds of people all over the world in a given day or week when they release their films. The media is the primary controlling factor that manipulates the mind of the youth in America and the world. And you had better realize that although the context of some movies is extremely violent it is also very subtle. In order for you to counteract the negative vibrations, you must give Pope Leo the, uh, the, the 13th his prayer as often as you can. No, you've already given that prayer in this service. How did it happen to come about? Well, the story is this. It was after he had finished one of his uh, his services that he overheard Satan speaking to our Lord. Satan requested 75 years to attempt to destroy the church. The Lord said, you have the time, you have the power, do what you will. The Pope understood that, that if the devil had not accomplished his purpose at the end of the time limit, he would suffer a crushing defeat. He also understood that through prayer and sacrifice and living good Christian lives, we could offset the power of the devil and his human agents. Thus, Pope Leo composed a prayer to invoke Archangel Michael's intercession, which was said at the conclusion of the Mass for 78 years. It was discontinued, unfortunately, after Vatican II. Pope Leo XIII's prayer, revised and outdated, or updated by the messengers for students of the Ascended Masters, is included in the decrees that we said this morning as the service began. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in Armageddon. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us 
in Armageddon. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, bind the forces of death and hell, the seed of Satan, the false hierarchy of Antichrist, and all evil spirits who wander through the world of the ruin uh, for the ruin of souls. Are you thinking when you're saying this? Are we aware of what we are asking Archangel Michael to do? Are we feeling it in the depths of our beings? Or are we just saying it because everybody else is saying it? It's very important to understand why it's important for us to get down into the depths of our being when we pray this. And remind and remand them to the court of the sacred fire for their final judgment. Cast out the dark ones and their darkness, the evil doers of the uh, and their evil words and works, cause, effect, record, and memory into the lake of sacred fire, prepared for the devil of his ain and his angels. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Divine Mother. Amen. But there's another way in which we can also affect this problem of evil and evil um, forces. It's with these astrayas. Number 10.14 uh, 10 in your decree book. Mighty Astraea is the person who is prepared to totally in, in, in mesh negativity with blue flame. We started out by on the staff by doing 14 of them. That took quite a while and it was a lot of work. And then suddenly they were asked to not only do 14 of them, do 144 of them. Whoa! 144 astrayas? It was an amazing thing. And we did it three times a week. We worked with it. Jesus comes along and says, What a boon it has been for the hierarchy that you have increased your astrayas, often giving 144 or 72 three times a week. I bow before the light of everyone here who has kept that vigil with me and with mighty astrea. The entire hierarchy of the Great White Brotherhood paused to observe the action of your calls to Mighty Astrea. The entire hierarchy of the Great White Brotherhood paused to watch what was happening as we did this work. Many souls have been spared untold suffering while others have been cut free from the abject darkness and the of the, astr of the astral plane. Beloved, know that some souls in such a state of self-degradation that as you gave your calls, the demons out of death and hell were already clawing at their ankles and clutching their feet. Aware of your support and your caring these souls then wrestled with the demons until Astraea, aware, let's see, the Astraea decree momentum accelerated the tier upon tier of circles of, of, of blue ray around them, and they were saved from the negative vibrations. Approximately, he says, one million souls on earth have totally escaped hell solely by the work of the astrayas that you, the staff and keepers of the flame, have given since you began giving 144 astrayas three times a week. Truly, the prayer of the righteous availeth much. I would point out to you that there has been a selection process in the saving of souls. As we see how much energy you have put out in your astrayas, we allot that energy to souls who are most deserving 
but we are also concerned with rewarding you who have faithfully given these calls. Therefore we look down upon your life streams, you who have not spared your astrayas, and we say, who are the souls who should be serving with you because they are part of your spiritual family whom we now make you aware. And he's talking about we, we incarnate in spiritual families lifetime after lifetime. That's why when we meet certain people we, have, we already know them because we have been with them many times before. And so uh, this is our spiritual family. And because we are willing to give our energy this way, some of those that have missed the path are now being brought in by that energy that we have invested. And because you have not failed to give your calls to Australia, we reunite you with those who are part of the same soul group to which you belong. And in your behalf, we rescue them if they have descended into the astral plane. In this wise, we reward those who are steadfast on the path of Astraea. So we are rewarded by the energy and the work that we are doing spiritually for the Ascended Masters and for others. Some of you have not yet caught the spark of giving your calls to Astraea for you still have not seen the darkness that is coming upon the earth. To you I say, this may be your final warning. And I think we should really listen to that. This could be our final warning. You see, many of us have heard the teachings for many years, and yes, we may have been on the staff and we may have been decreeing many, many, many hours and so on, but now we're sort of taking it for granted. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the teachings and so on. He said, do not look to your ascension in this life unless you are willing to take responsibility for your soul and for the members of your soul group. And one indispensable means of taking such responsibility is to lock your energy into Astraea's circle and sword of blue flame to cut yourself free and to cut free the members of your soul group from all astral entanglements. Do not think that just because you are in physical embodiment or just because you warm the seat when you sit in your sanctuary that you will automatically attain ascensions flame. It takes a lot, beloved, to make your ascension. And then I must cover one more area before we close. He says, I tell you, no one who keeps one foot on the astral plane, get that picture, no one who keeps one foot on the astral plane will make his ascension in this life unless he determines to engage in a fierce battle against the entities of his addictions and vanquishes all desire to be a part of the beautiful people who strut about the streets of hell all the while knowing that they are godless, soulless ones. And I speak not only to keepers of the flame at large, but also to my staff in Maitreya's Mystery School. Some of you still need me to light a fire under you, and light a fire under you I shall. I, Jesus, state for the record that it is my desire that you not watch motion pictures more than twice a month. It is also my desire that the videotapes you bring into your homes be quality entertainment suitable for family members of all ages. If you spend your evenings passing the time watching movies or television indiscriminately, you are not truly one with me. You are not truly a part of my heart. 
You do not truly share my sorrow on Golgotha. You do not truly share my resurrection in glory. You do not share it even though you think you do. Therefore to you keepers of the flame, I say, if you do not embrace my sacred heart, if you do not uphold the high principles, if you do not set aside prayer time and Holy Spirit time, at some point you will have to admit to yourselves that you are keepers of the flame in name only. All keepers of the flame have a heart tie to Maitreya and his mystery school through the mother of the flame. I should not have to speak to you regarding these things for you have been given so great a salvation. I should not have to speak to you about what should be doing what you should be doing with your so-called free time when the world is in such pain when innocent children are victims in the useless war and are left maimed and dying for want of medical care and when the diseases of the last plagues are taking the lives of millions daily think about this each time you take in a worldly motion picture. It takes you a minimum of five days to transmute it if you have a good momentum of your Vita Flame decrease, and much longer if you don't. For those who do not decree at all, the records of their media experiences, including rock concerts and Violet Violent, uh, viol uh, violent films pile up, a, pile up in the psyche and the sounds and the scenes come up again and again as though they were actual life experiences. Who in his right mind would want thus to burden his soul? Select motion pictures that, prof that profile the heroes of history, the rise and fall of civilizations, the origins of major religions of the world, and a wealth of cultural materials that, the, that teaches children about the world they have incarnated into. Think about how many hours you devote to entertainment that does not afford you a net gain physically or spiritually. Think about how you could spend the same amount of time developing a powerful spiritual momentum on giving calls for the healing of those who mourn, all who are sick, all who are dying and fear death. The hours you spend in unproductive activity are costly very costly both to you and to us as we are your sponsors. I speak to you out of the octaves of light and I say wake up. It is impossible for you to imagine how difficult it is once you leave the earth plane through the challenge the change called death to balance karma to advance on the path or to make headway with your vital flame decrease to the extent that you will be able to accelerate your reincarnation on the earth. In this scenario I'm assuming that you will have made it to the etheric octave although this is, not, is by no means not guaranteed you. You cannot imagine, you cannot imagine first how difficult it is to get back into embodiment. They say there are thousands upon thousands waiting because of abortion. We kill them off. Therefore they can't come in to do the job they have to do to ascend. 
if we could only understand what our situation is. We have a chance now, let's make the use of it. Secondly, he says, how difficult it is to find the path once you do get back. All depends on the environment you come into, the family that you're working with, the environment of the community that you're raised in, the whole civilization. And he said, third, how difficult it is to forge and win your victory once you are back on track having taken many detours. I say to you, beloved, you know not what the future will bring. All the more reason why you should be concerned about it. For I tell you, I know what the future will bring. And I am concerned that you will not be prepared for it. I am concerned that although you have had the teachings for many years, nothing and no one has been able to set you on fire for the cause of world freedom. And for those who have that cause, they're now considered to be enemies, you know or even for the cause of your personal freedom. What will it take for you to ignite your own fire and to become such shining sheilas that you would not even entertain the idea of wasting time watching movies night after night as many of you have been doing? I pray this discussion marks the end of this subject for some time to come. For I intend, beloved, that you shall cease your sensual indulgences. It is a dishonor to Lord Maitreya that you should be out of alignment with him day after day. Lord Maitreya is my guru, my father. I expect you to honor him as you honor me. Therefore, set the example of the Guru Chila relationship. Set the world on fire by your example. If things are too monotonous here, get out the door and join a stump team headed for Bangladesh and continue on to the heart of Calcutta. Go around the world and see what human misery is all about. Wake up and see with your own eyes that there is a job to be done. And if you expect to have your crown and halo, well, beloved, I have news for you. You had better get going in earnest because some of you are not doing enough to earn that crown and that halo. And it is up to me to inform you of your lack of progress. Now in the fire of the Holy Spirit, in the fire of the Holy Spirit, I speak to all and I say, you who have knowledge of spiritual things must convey the teaching and the word. You must liberally break bread, the bread of life, liberally Share the communion cup and give to all my love, my love, my love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for helping to align us in this moment. And grant us the courage to be who we really are. Bless us to this end. And for we ask it in your holy name, Jesus, my Lord and my Master.